Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this webinar is part of a CAE Associates ANTIS e-learning series. CAE Associates is an engineering consulting firm in Middlebury, Connecticut, specializing in finite element analysis and computational fluid dynamics. We have been an ANSYS channel partner since 1985 and have developed our ANSYS e-learning series to help maximize your software investment. Uh, please visit our website, which includes an extensive resource library with over 250 items and counting in an easily searchable area. Uh, we also invite you to visit our Engineering Advantage blog, where we share insights from our many years of experience performing engineering analysis. CAE Associates also offers an extensive schedule of ANSYS courses taught at our Middlebury office. If you need help deciding on the best courses to take for your application, visit our CAE University page. The complete library of e-learning recordings is available for viewing in our resource library and also on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash CAEAI. Uh, if you are a licensed PE in New Jersey or New York State and you wish to obtain a PE credit for your attendance today, we ask that you attend the entire webinar, participate in all the polls, and complete a short survey that will be emailed to you at the conclusion of today's presentation. Today's topic is nonlinear buckling analysis and workbench. I'm going to present just a few quick slides just to introduce uh, the topic, and then we'll uh, I'll show you a few uh, demos, or at least uh, you know, uh, show workbench, open up workbench, and show you some examples. Uh, today we're talking about buckling, which is a structural um, stability problem, or more uh, accurately, it's 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 an instability problem, uh, and it's as you most people recognize if you look at the classic case of a column under compression, uh, it, a column will handle a certain amount of compressive load and then eventually uh, it will suddenly become unstable and with no increase in force it will start to have a large deformation or displacement and that's the instability that we're trying to model. When you go to do this in finite elements, uh, what happens essentially is there's two different ways to approach it. One is we call the linear eigenvalue buckling. And in linear eigenvalue buckling, it's nothing more than what you would do uh, to get the theoretical limit if you uh, looked in a textbook uh, or uh, you know, basically derived it from first principles. That would, is essentially the same thing as doing a linear eigenvalue buckling analysis. That's typically very conservative, uh, or non-conservative, I should say, because in uh, in reality, you're gonna, the structure is not going to be a, a perfect thing like you model it in finite elements. Um, so therefore, you will have an imperfect structure which will buckle sooner, and we can usually calculate the uh, response of something that buckles sooner than the theoretical limit using a non-buckling, non-linear buckling analysis. And we'll talk very briefly about both linear and non-linear buckling analysis today. So first, let's start with linear buckling analysis. Again, it's the a way to calculate the theoretical buckling strength. Um, keep in mind that, as I mentioned, it's non-conservative to run a linear buckling analysis because a real structure has imperfections. It will, may, may have nonlinear behavior going on, and therefore, um, it, the real structure won't will probably buckle sooner. So then, the question may be, well, why would you even run a linear eigenvalue buckling problem. And the two reasons are listed below. One is it's very fast. Uh, usually you can uh, run a linear eigenvalue buckling analysis very quickly. And so it's at least going to give you a ballpark figure, uh, the theoretical limit, upper limit of what buckling will be. And secondly, we can sometimes use that the buckled shape that comes out of the eigenvalue problem, and we can uh, use that as input to our to create an imperfection in our nonlinear buckling analysis. Uh, we're just going to talk very briefly about the derivation. It's very simple. Um, if you think about our general linear finite element analysis equation, we have force equals 
stiffness times displacement. Uh, we're all aware of that. So let's assume we have a model that we start putting a compressive load on. And again, we're assuming that it's, in the, it's linear, it hasn't buckled yet. As we apply that compressive load, um, what we essentially have is that we have this initial stress matrix that's caused by the compressive stress. And because that's a negative, it's actually, it's compressive, that's really a negative term. And we can add that term to the elastic stiffness. And assuming that things are essentially linear uh, early on before we've buckled, we can say if you apply, let's say, a unit load, uh, and that will give you the displacements and the stresses and the initial stiffness matrix, all of those things can be scaled linearly by this factor lambda so that for any given load, it's just going to be lambda, the initial stiffness matrix will just be lambda times that original stiffness matrix. So when we get to the onset of instability, what we're saying is that if we apply a compressive load and eventually we don't need to apply any more and the displacements will just get very large and will become unstable. That's essentially saying that the change in the load will essentially become zero at the onset of buckling. If we plug that into our equation, uh, we have really two solutions. One is the trivial solution that the displacements are zero and we don't want that solution. The other solution is that the determinant of our stiffness term there is set to zero. And if you solve that uh, determinant, the, all the lambdas are the eigenvalues and uh, they would represent the buckling load factor. So if you apply a unit load and then you go ahead and calculate this buckling factor, it would the buckling factor would just be that factor times a unit load, and that would what would be would cause buckling. So we can from this uh, eigenvalue equation calculate the lowest value that would cause buckling. Um, so what I'd like to do is a, a quick demonstration and just show you uh, open up Workbench and show you a linear eigenvalue buckling problem. But before I do, um, I'd like uh, Christina, if she's still on the line, to, uh, to give us uh, a polling question, just so we, I get an idea of uh, what you're interested in. So you have a, like 30 seconds to just pick a quick answer. All basically I'm looking for is I'd like to know how many of you out there currently perform buckling analysis with Workbench. and um, and I'll just let you select uh, your, your best answer for this. And we'll give it a few seconds to uh, fill in the, the solution here. Okay, and uh, just looking at, at the results here, it uh, um, it looks like at least a portion of you do do some buckling analysis, and uh, I guess the the major portion has not. So I think that's a that's that's a pretty good uh, representation of what we would expect. So okay, so let's jump to. Uh, Workbench, and you see the project page here. I actually have two different projects. We're going to just talk about a very simple cylinder buckling. And the way this is done, I already have it set up for time's sake. Uh, you first are going to perform a static structural analysis, and you're going to typically apply a unit load. There are reasons why you might not want to do that, and we don't have time to get into all the different scenarios. But let's just say we have the cylinder. We're going to apply a unit load to it. And so we'll just get a trivial static solution. Then you would go over to the left side, grab a linear buckling from the toolbox, and drop it onto the solution of the static structural. So it, much like a analogous to a pre-stress modal analysis, kind of the same thing. You start with a static structural that has the compressive loads in it. Usually a unit load is all that's required. You drop on a linear buckling analysis. And so now if I open up mechanical, for this case, you'll notice because they're sharing everything, they're in the same uh, mechanical 
outline, so you see the static structural solution. So in here, we have our mesh of a very simple cylinder. We kind of made this to be sort of like a, uh, a soda can, um, except with no top and bottom. And we're applying just a downward one pound force on the top of that cam. And at the bottom, we're just taking, essentially taking away rigid body motion. We're allowing it to uh, expand how it wants to on the bottom. And if we look at the total deformation when we run that simple case, all it does is it compresses it because, again, it's, it's a linear analysis and it's, uh, you know, so it's, it's not going to predict buckling. It's just going to say that we have a perfect structure and therefore it's just going to compress it. But we want to know what the theoretical buckling, lowest buckling factor is. So when we add the linear buckling, it automatically knows that it adds the fact that our pre-stress that defines the compressive load is set to our static structural analysis that was attached to. And in our analysis settings, it's pretty simple. You're just going to pick the maximum modes. Sometimes you might be interested in more than just the lowest mode. In this case, we're really interested in the mode to buckle this, and then we're, uh, we're all set. So we just run that analysis. If you click on solution down below in the tabular data, you'll see the load multiplier. And that's really what we're after. Um, this says that it would take a load of, of 1,549 pounds times our unit load, so it would be 1549, that would buckle this. And if we look at the total deformation, which is our, uh, our mode shape, essentially our, our buckled shape, you see that it buckles into the shape shown there. Um, Note that, uh, by the way, if you did this theoretically, uh, you could also get the same mode shape here. The mode shape, by the way, is based on the height uh, versus the radius of the cylinder that you're looking at. For this particular case, it buckles into uh, the shape that we see here. So what I'd like to do uh, is move on now. Let's talk about nonlinear buckling. When you do a nonlinear buckling analysis, as I mentioned, we're, we're trying to build in the fact that we don't have perfect columns and perfect structures. We have imperfections in our real uh, models, and these imperfections will cause our structures to buckle under compressive loads earlier than the theoretical limit predicted by linear eigenvalue buckling. Uh, and so as you can see here from the force deflection curve, we would expect that before you get to the, the linear buckling load, the imperfections will cause uh, buckling to occur. In a nonlinear buckling analysis, you can include imperfections. You can include any kind of nonlinear uh, features, such as contact, uh, material nonlinearities like plasticity. Uh, you, you, you definitely want to turn on large deformation analyses because you're going to be expecting the thing to buckle your structure will buckle, so you need to make sure you have geometric nonlinearities turned on as well. Uh, interesting thing is that if you run a nonlinear solution, you already know how to do a nonlinear buckling analysis, because the nonlinear buckling analysis is simply ramping on the compressive load and running a nonlinear solution until it stops converging due to the structural instability. And the key there is you, as the analyst, has to Verif must verify that the analysis stopped running due to your structural instability and not for any other uh, reason. And we'll, we, we'll do that by looking at the, at the display shape, looking at the force deflection curve, and so on, and I'll be demonstrating that shortly. Um, I just wanted to point out that post-buckling can also be sometimes modeled based on your structure. Post-buckling is when, even though you buckle initially, the structure will be able to take additional load. And we'll talk a little bit about how you can model post-buckling as well and show an example. So the only real difference when you run a nonlinear solution, uh, since if you already know how to run a nonlinear solution, you can run a nonlinear buckling analysis. The only real key is if you have a perfectly shaped structure, you typically need to do something to get an imperfection in. For example, if you have a perfectly uh, perfect cylinder like we had he, uh, in our demo, you have to 
make it so that it's not perfect. And usually we do that by applying a very, very small load, a small pressure, or we even will change the, the, the position of the nodes just very slightly just to give it that imperfection. Um, you also, since you typically will run a linear buckling analysis so you can, you'll know what the theoretical limit of the load is so you can make sure you probably are going to assume that it will buckle before it reaches there. So we normally recommend you throw, you start ramping up the load to a value that's maybe a little bit higher than the linear buckling load. Make sure you have all your nonlinearities uh, activated, especially geometric nonlinearities. Um, write out intermediate result steps because you, you can't just run this to the end and assume that's your buckled shape. Buckling can be a nonlinear buckling can be just like any other nonlinear analysis. Uh, it's really uh, dependent on how the structure behaves, and you really need to look at its intermediate locations. And keep in mind that if you run it like a symmetric model, if, even though your geometry and load are symmetric, your buckled shape may not be. So be very careful about modeling a symmetric sector. You're only going to get symmetric buckled shapes. Um, again, the initial perturbation, you do want to be careful that whatever perturbation that you or imperfection you, you add is realistic and because um, it will affect, obviously, the, the buckling load. Uh, one of the things that we recommend, for example, is in many cases we'll use, we might adjust something slightly on the order of the manufacturing tolerance, tolerances of the part, or we'll just put in a very, very small load, enough that if you vary that load uh, a little bit, it doesn't change the buckle shape if we try you know, running several cases. Um, one of the things we highly recommend, and you can do this in Workbench very easily, is create a chart and look at, at key points and look at the force deflection curve. Um, if you see that the force deflection is going up, but it's not really flattened out, remember, buckling means that if you apply additional load, it does, you don't need any more additional load to get additional displacement. So it should eventually flatten out. If you see that it doesn't, and you have an unconverged solution, and the tangent stiffness isn't quite zero, um, it might mean that you uh, didn't you stopped converging for something else, like a numerical issue, not for the structural instability. So you, you want to really take a look closely at your results to make sure that's the case. It should be more of a uh, really a zero tangent stiffness before it, it stops converging. As I mentioned, ANSYS can predict post-buckling behavior. In some cases, based on your, your geometry, you don't really need to do very much because there are many cases where the, the lowest buckling modes may be local modes, where it buckles, but it continues to hold, uh, hold the load. Um, like if you're standing on like thin uh, sheet metal, I've been in places where it'll buckle down under your weight, but it still continues to hold you know, your weight after that. So, ANSYS can, can do that uh, and calculate post-buckling. Um, sometimes you need, it's difficult to get it to pass through certain buckled shapes to do it, and ANSYS has a option, the stabilize option, that can help you push the analysis further uh, past when, uh, you know, it will initially buckle. Uh, the way the stabilize option works is it adds artificial damping uh, to provide, so when you have that resistive force, it's applying a little bit of damping load as the displacements are increasing, and it just allows it to continue to be, uh, to continue on to calculate further response. So what I would like to do at this point is go back to Workbench, and just uh, at this point I'm going to open up our same model with the, uh, the cylinder, and in this case, um, we're now going to run a nonlinear analysis. Uh, the big difference here is if you look at the loading, in addition to we're going to ramp up the load to 2,000 pounds, keep in mind that the, uh, you know, we, we, I guess the theoretical buckling load was around 1,550. So we're going to ramp it a little higher than that just to make sure we capture uh, the buckle, buckling load. In addition, we have a second load here, which is a very, very small load of point. 01 pounds, and all that is is just a little imperfection to kind of nudge it so that it, it's not going to be perf 
perfect. And keep in mind, in Workbench, a lot of times, all you need is something a little different. In some cases, if, if the mesh isn't uh, exactly uh, symmetric or, um, you know, if, if there's just a little change in the mesh from one side to the other, if you have weak springs turned on, sometimes that's enough to give it a little imperfection. You just need some stiffness imperfection in the model just so that it doesn't see it as a perfect structure. And I went ahead and started running this, and uh, uh, you can see that you know as it ran through, I'm just showing you like a displacement convergence that it it ran through and then starting started having some trouble, and it, it basically made it to uh, a value of 1450. Now, what I did is I set the, the total time to be equal to my loading. So I set the total time to be 2000. So I would know at a what particular time that it failed, that would be the load value since I'm ramping up the 2000 pound load. So my time where it ends up failing was around 1450. And you notice if I look at the deformation at that point, um, that it did uh, again, go into the same mode shape that we saw from the theoretical value. And as I said, the, the buckled factor here is about 1450, which is a little bit lower than the 1550 that we got theoretically. So in this particular case, the, the nonlinear buckling factor or buckling load was about 100 pounds less. Uh, one other thing that we can look at is you can create a chart uh, in Workbench, and what you would do is, for example, you could uh, attach a probe to a point, a key point in the model. So I attach the probe, for example, at this location at the top, and then you can add up here in this little icon this new chart and table. You can highlight that probe and hit the chart button, and then it creates, uh, it'll it'll plot the value of the displacement at, of that probe as a function of time. And remember, I, may, I, I set time to my load, so I essentially can put the time on the, in my chart, I can put the time on the vertical axis and that displacement of that probe on the horizontal axis, and that's essentially my force deflection curve at that point. And what you can clearly see is for this analysis, you know, it, it started applying the load and it was ramping up, and it, you know, it's not, it becomes nonlinear because it's not linear, so the force deflection curve starts bending over, and essentially it flattens out at that load value, which is around uh, 1450, and you can see it's pretty much flat. We can be pretty sure that this has reached its buckled limit and be confident. I want to jump into uh, another model just to show you a little, something a little bit more interesting. Here's like this kind of roof structure. Uh, it's kind of cantilevered, so it's fixed on the back surface here. It has these three uh, loads that are applied in the radial direction at those, at those locations. And so the first thing I did uh, for this particular model is we applied uh, a unit load to those locations, and we got this deformation that looks exciting, and then we added a linear buckling, drag the linear buckling on top of this linear static uh, structural analysis, and we ran the linear buckling analysis. And uh, what we what we got here is, if you look at our first buckled mode, it the load uh, was 71,000. We're in newtons. We I switched units on you, so we're in newtons now. So we got a buckled shape. Uh, that is, that occurs at a, a load of 71,000. So, uh, and as you might imagine, it's kind of buckling based on where those loads are applied. So now we can go to a, a the nonlinear uh, model. So normally, by the way, what we do with nonlinear buckling is you would take the original static structural and you just duplicate that because it's going to, it should be the same structure, the same model. And uh, now that you bring that up, now we can turn on, for example, under analysis settings, we're going to go down and turn on large deflections. Um, in this case, that's really all we did. There's no contact or anything else. Uh, and we apply our forces. Again, because this structure actually isn't a perfectly 
structure that will just compress. It actually will buckle on its own. There's no real reason to apply an imperfection, but if it does have a particular imperfection, you could always add that. Uh, and then we ran that analysis. And what, what you see here is the final, it, it finally buckles. And I'm going to see if I can turn on. You can see from the, if I turn on the undeformed shape, it buckled at the center kind of here. And then it also ended up buckling down towards the front at the end of the cantilever beam here. Uh, if you look at the time, again, I set the time to the loading. In this case, we uh, went all the way up to 573,000 newtons, which is, if you remember, the initial buckle shape was 71,000. So this went well beyond the initial buckling factor. And uh, we can, I can kind of show you uh, what happened here for this case. If I look at an early deformation as we apply the load, you can see that as we start applying the load, the structure starts to buckle. You can sort of see that uh, down below these the loads, we're getting the, the kind of the thin structure to buckle in. We're also getting a little buckling of the uh, stiffeners there. And if we, we so we go past kind of the initial buckling, and what happens is this structure can still handle the loading. So therefore, as this continues to buckle through and we keep ramping up the load, it's still able to go past the initial buckling load and still uh, handle much more loading. And that continues onward. And at this case, we're up to 200,000. Uh, then if we go to uh, 450,000 newtons, it's still buckling, and but it's still able to handle the ramp up and load until finally we get a secondary buckling where now it buckles down the front of that, and at that point, it stops converging. If we look at uh, the buckle or the force deflection in the same way, I added a chart. Um, one, one trick you can do here in Workbench, if you're unaware, is if you when you create a chart, you can see that once it buckled, it kind of just went crazy. So if you want to zoom into a, a, a part, you can just uh, move your mouse, drag a region, right click, and say zoom to range, and you can zoom that portion of the plot. And this is a force deflection curve that was taken at, at this point right here at the center uh, location. And what you can see is very interesting is we start with the kind of a linear response, and then it starts to buckle, which is, again, a little bit before you would have the initial buckling of 71,000 that we saw from the linear buckling analysis. And you can see from it turning over that it does lose some stiffness, but it's not, it's not buckled completely. The, it can still handle more load, as you can see, as it starts buckling, eventually it starts stiffening again. That's just like the trampoline effect, the stress stiffening effect. As you're pushing down, the in-plane uh, response is stiffening the through thickness response, and you actually get that stiffening until, at this point, that's when you get the buckling of the front of this start to go. So the, the, the front eventually uh, will start to go down. And at that point, now it's much harder for it to converge as that starts buckling down, and eventually it pretty much flattens out and stops converging at all. Um, if we look at the corner point and do a force deflection curve there, and again, I have to uh, zoom into that range. Again, it's, so now we're doing the force deflection at this corner front corner point. You can see here that it, you don't get a lot of deformation at first while the middle is buckling. And then right when you get to that location and that force, it suddenly lets go at the front, starts buckling down. When you get a lot of displacement for very little load, it flattens out and you get buckling. And so, again, you look at the time, which I set to the load, and you can see that it's about a value of 574,000. And so that would uh, – you, you can't just blindly look at the final load and say that's my first buckling load. You have to understand how the structure is – going through its various intermediate and then localized buckling to get to something that, that uh, makes the, the entire structure unstable. And one final thing to show you is, just for fun, we said, well, what if, can we make this run any further? Um, so one of the things we did is I went 
with the same model, nonlinear buckling. And in this case, I went to the nonlinear uh, controls below. And down here, you can see there is a stabilization control. And I mentioned that in briefly, that uh, this allows you to try to model additional post-buckling by applying some damping. And if we do that, very quickly, just to show you, what happens is it went further and it buckled even more in the front. So I think it's pretty clear. I can turn on the undeformed wireframe to show you how it buckled in the front. And if you look at the value of the load, it went up to 585,000. So it went an extra 10,000 newtons and it went a little bit further than it did before, but then it still ended up buckling. And of course, if you look at the, uh, the force deflection curve by adding a chart, you can clearly see here again, uh, again, this is looking at a, at a probe. So again, the way you do this is you would add a displacement probe at a certain location in a certain direction, and then you add a chart. When you highlight that probe and you add the chart from the new chart table, it'll automatically plot that. And since I made the time equal to the applied load, uh, I can then just set this up in the details to make it a force deflection. And you can clearly see it has the same exact uh, behavior. And then at the end, you can really see that this has applied additional loading, and we're getting just a lot more displacement. And eventually, it, that's 